Maya Aylward, and I work in the Van Burla lab, and I will be attending Emory University next year as a freshman. This summer, I've been studying the proliferation and population size of fibroblasts and macrophages during early cardiac remodeling, which is a process that leads to heart failure. It is known that the population of fibroblasts grows based on the amount of space available, whereas macrophage populations grow based on uh, growth factors such as CSF1, which is secreted by fibroblasts. We use this information to develop our hypothesis, which is that fibroblasts control the macrophage population during the early phase of cardiac remodeling. We studied heart tissue from surgically induced cardiac stress mice, or control mice, uh, through histology, which uses antibodies to stain certain cells, such as proliferating macrophages or fibroblasts. We found evidence to establish a line of reasoning to support our hypothesis. However, further experimentation is necessary to develop a causal relationship between the fibroblast population and the macrophage population growth. To do this, we plan on controlling or depleting the fibroblast population and investigating any possible changes to the macrophage population. Hi, I'm Nathan DeMichaelis, and this summer I worked with Dr. June and Dr. Ouchi. Uh, my interest this summer was something called the Mitochondrial Permeability Transition Pore, or MPTP. Uh, this pore is a large channel that forms in the inner mitochondrial membrane under cardiac stress conditions, such as a heart attack, and it can cause the mitochondria to swell, rupture, and release cell that signaling. Our lab previously showed that protein kinase D, or PKD, signaling can partially opening, open the harmful MPTP. So this led me to the question to answer this summer. Does PKD uh, interact with and or phosphorylate um, different components of the MPTP to regulate it. First, I looked at whether PKD directly binds to and interacts with components of the MPTP, and I was unable to show that it does. So, next I looked at phosphorylation and found that the C subunit, which is the most important component of the MPTP that actually forms the channel, was um, phosphorylated at higher levels when PKD was overexpressed. So, I next looked at a software to analyze the amino acid sequence and found that in the C subunit there is a PKD specific phosphorylation target site which is in the matrix of the mitochondria. These results point to a potential novel way that the MPTB is regulated by post-translational modification and also a potential therapeutic target by going after PKD to stop cardiomyocyte death. First, I assessed whether PKD directly binds to different components of the MPTP, and I found that it did not stably interact with these subunits. Next, I looked at phosphorylation of the MPTP by PKD, and I found that overexpressing PKD in these cells resulted in increased phosphorylation of the C subunit, which is the most important subunit that actually forms the channel. So, I looked at using 
phosphorylation prediction software to see whether or not there was a uh, PKD specific phosphorylation target in the C subunit. And I found that there was one uh, exposed in the inner uh, matrix side of the mitochondria. These results point to a potential novel way that the MPTP is regulated and also a potential way to therapeutically target PKD to prevent cell death. Hi, my name is Michael Gilligan, and this summer I was given the opportunity to do research under Dr. Kurt Brins. My research project was an exploration into the mechanisms by which estrogen mitigates right ventricular fibrosis. Right ventricular fibrosis can be caused by a myriad of factors, such as pulmonary arterial hypertension and mechanical stressors. The reason why right ventricular fibrosis becomes so dangerous is because myofibroblasts accumulate in the heart tissue and deposit collagen, causing some scarring. And this scarring can make your right ventricle smaller. And now when your right ventricle is smaller, your heart must work harder to pump blood and reoxygenate it through the pulmonary artery. We know that generally speaking, estrogen plays a cardioprotective role against fibrosis. This is an amazing breakthrough as it can tell us a lot about the sex differences and long-term heart health of men and women. Now, we know that estrogen plays this cardioprotective role, but we don't know exactly how it does that, and that's where I come in. In my project, we determined whether microtubule remodeling mechanisms was the process by which estrogen mitigated cardiac fibrosis. So we took these fibroblasts and we treated them with TGF-beta-1, which stands for Transforming Growth Factor Beta-1. And we looked for increased microtubule density and increased nuclear area, signs of fibrosis. Then we added estrogen, our treatment, which in theory should decrease microtubule density and nuclear area, a sign that our treatment process worked. However, our results were negative and nuclear area and microtubule density did not change from our transforming growth factor treatment. Therefore, microtubule remodeling mechanisms were likely not the process by which estrogen mitigated cardiac fibrosis. Hi, my name is Arhe Jain, a sophomore at the University of Minnesota majoring in neuroscience and human physiology. I had the incredible opportunity to work in Dr. Perlin Jero's lab, which focuses on regenerative medicine and muscle biology. In my project, we're, the goal is to generate uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from non-human primates. Induced pluripotent stem cells are a type of master cells which can be generated anywhere in the body, from skeleton to muscle to brain cells. In my research, we used blood samples from three non-human primates. Cynomolgus monkeys. Why NHPs? Because their genetic material is very similar to humans, making their cells perfect to answer complex biological questions for muscle repair and transplantation. Using a commercial kit, we reprogram mononuclear cell fraction from blood, which was then uh, cultured in a controlled environment. After about three weeks, we found cell colony formation with typical iPSC morphology which we picked up and expanded for further characterization. These consisted of pluripotent markers OCT4, SOX2 and NANOG. This confirmed our successful generation of iPSC lines. The next step is to produce myogenic progenitors from these iPSC lines for future transplants and studies. Hi, my name is Willie Liu, and this summer, my research project at the Visible Heart Lab focused on coronary arteries, which supply oxygenated blood to the heart. Coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death in adults globally, and it is caused when the coronary arteries become blocked by plaque. Now, uh, percutaneous coronary intervention has become the most common treatment in which typically a stent is expanded to open up the blockage and to keep it open. Stents must be expanded enough to have proper contact with the vessel wall while also avoiding overexpanding the vessel. This is complicated by the fact that coronary arteries naturally taper or decrease in diameter. 
It also doesn't help that imaging inside of vessels is rarely used in PCI procedures. And even when it is, the resolution and range are limited to that segment of vessel. That is why for my project, we used high resolution micro CT scanning to determine the rate of tapering in main coronary artery vessels as well as in branches. We scanned five adult human hearts with healthy coronary arteries, and then the coronary arteries were injected with contrast. After being scanned, the 3D models of the coronary arteries were reproduced, and analysis of center lines was done, such that the diameters along points of the center line were calculated and, and recorded. The rate of tapering of coronary arteries was determined by the slope of the linear regression of distance versus diameter. The results of my study will help inform stent and balloon sizing considerations, especially in PCI procedures that involve bifurcation stenting at branch points. The data can also ultimately be used to train machine learning models to identify diseased vessels. Hi everyone, I'm Izzy, and this summer I'm working in the Kaiba lab studying the ducks gene family. So Dux4 is one member of the Dux family, and it is the cause of FSHD, which is a type of, type of muscular dystrophy. There are two other family members, Dux A and Dux B, and neither of these are toxic in their wild type state. However, my lab discovered that when we fuse an activation domain to the end of them, that Dux A is able to acquire toxicity, however, Dux B is not. Therefore, my project is interested in trying to determine why Dux B is unable to acquire toxicity. I do this using molecular methods to perform domain substitutions of the DNA binding region of Dux B into the functional Dux A and Dux 4. This project is important because it's going to give us insights into the functionality of the ducts homeodomain regions, and it could be important for developing therapeutics to FSHD. Hi, my name is Mitch Newman. I'm a biochemistry major at the University of Minnesota. I'm working in the Dudley Lab this summer, studying atrial fibrillation, or AFib, which impacts over 60 million people worldwide. Diabetes, people with diabetes are at higher risk for developing AFib due to inflammation, oxidative stress, and phosphorylation of ryanidine receptor 2, uh, which is a channel protein, and cardiomyocytes. People with diabetes also often have hypomagnesemia, or low magnesium, which also increases inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, importantly, this inflammation and oxidative stress is reversible with magnesium repletion. Therefore, in this study, we looked into the impact of hypomagnesemia on atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation risk and its potential reversibility with magnesium repletion. In our study, we had three groups of mice, one on normal diet, one on low magnesium diet, and another on low magnesium diet followed by normal diet or magnesium repletion. We measured inflammation, oxidative stress, and ranidine, ranidine receptor phosphorylation and AFib inducibility in these mice and found that indeed hypomagnesemia increases AFib risk um, and it is reversible with magnesium repletion. These findings could evidence future therapies for people with atrial fibrillation, especially in those with diabetes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nithin Peretti and this summer I had the opportunity to work in the Ogle Lab. One of the lab's main focuses is studying the effects of the extracellular matrix, or ECM, the fluid slash web of proteins outside of the cell surface, and their effect on the differentiation of stem cells into cardiac cells, examples being fibroblasts and cardiomyocytes. The lab additionally researches approaches to making ECM formulations that support the maturation and differentiation of stem cells uh, that can be used to be incorporated into engineered heart tissue such as human chambered muscle pumps. My project specifically focused on making engineered cardiac cylinders made of human fibroblasts and cardiomyocytes and observing how much they compact over time uh, by measuring their length and thickness. Uh, the findings and techniques in my project can be applied to making full Orion artificial models capable of real biological function and aided in the study of physiology and the effects of diseases and other external cues on heart development and function.
Hi, my name is Emily Tennis, and I'm in Dr. Townsend's lab studying the efficacy of microdystrophin at replacing dystrophin in patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which results from a genetic mutation in the um, stabilizing and pr um, protective protein dystrophin. And in order to study this, we use transgenic mice, which have no dystrophin, and instead only have microdystrophin, which is a smaller version of that dystrophin protein. And in some of these transgenic mice, there is an isoproternal, a single dose of isoproternal, which increases the heart contractility and can therefore cause stress-induced injury in these hearts. And we used immunofluorescence staining and microscopy to take images of and identify the cell membrane, microdystrophin, and injury in heart sections. And then we used the ImageJ software to measure and quantify the amount of microdystrophin and injury in these hearts. And while we found that the microdystrophin is effective at alleviating the impact of the stress-induced injury, we found that the isopaternal stimulation actually causes degradation of microdystrophin, which therefore causes a lower levels of microdystrophin expression in these hearts. We expect this to leave the hearts more susceptible to injury in the future with lower levels of microdystrophin. And this therefore provides a significant limitation in using microdystrophin as a therapeutic approach to Duchenne's. Hello, my name is Jacob Welch, and this summer I worked studying the mitochondria. More specifically, we were looking at the proteins that tether the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the mitochondria. But why are these proteins important? They create tight intracellular compartments between the SR and the mitochondria that allow for effective calcium transport. And why is calcium important? Calcium plays an important role in the mitochondria for generating ATP, reactive oxygen species, metabolites, and many other functions. And so we were interested in, in seeing whether these proteins are altered in atrial fibrillation. So for our study, we took mice that we induced atrial fibrillation in, and we wanted to see if these proteins were different compared to wild-type normal healthy mice. And so from our results, we found that these proteins are being down-regulated, which tells us that the distance between the SR and the mitochondria is now increasing, which tells us that the calcium transport to the mitochondria has decreased, which results in less ATP, less RF production, just overall worse function in the mitochondria. And we think this might be a cause of atrial fibrillation. Thank you.